Yeah, absolutely. And I think, I don't know, you see the people that kind of high intensity interval training and they try and incorporate with resistance training, less in the bodybuilding kind of circuits. Yeah. I think it's more just like gen pop and they try and do all of that sort of thing. And it becomes appealing because of the epoch kind of uh, maybe a bit misinterpreted of how great that can be. But um, yeah, uh, I don't know if you want to move on to girth measurements or something along those lines, body weight, that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. So body composition, I think is a nice, a nice okay. topic. So, um, there's all, there's so many ways you can sort of assess this. One is just the mirror. Like if you're like some people, just guys who are really well, um, uh, experienced can look at the, look at the mirror and they can look at the scale and they can just know. Now when your brain and your mind starts to play tricks on you and you get to that point and, and I'll just say this, <clears throat> for many people, I think, and, and social media, uh, you know, you always have to throw that in there is one of the main thing I think that drives people's perception is that there's going to be sort of a psychological, this is my, this is my, this is my take on this is that many people have sort of a psychological limit as to how quote unquote out of shape or how much body fat they're going to allow themselves to gain. They're not going to be able to just release that limit and just start packing it on, even if that might be the best way for them to gain muscle. They may have to do that simply because they just don't gain muscle mass as well as someone else. So that's going to be sort of an overarching theme for any anything you're using to sort of estimate or visualize or assess your body composition as you're going along is what are you going to allow yourself to look like? some degree how how much body fat are you how many times are you gonna have to think okay i gotta go get new jeans because these just don't fit me anymore um so that's always there and that's gonna have to be balanced with someone's someone's bo uh, bodybuilding goals so why you're doing this how far do you want to go is it worthwhile to push yourself up in body fat where you may have you know your health parameters that are starting to get out of range those sorts of things it's going to be different for everybody. So there's going to be sort of your limits as to how far you're willing to get up to. And, so, and it may be that someone who, let's say, does have an accurate estimate of body fat, they find that they don't want to go above 14 or 15 percent. And just because of the way that they put on muscle mass relative to body fat, their unique physiology, their, their individuality, they may be limited in how much muscle mass they're going to ever gain over the course of their lifetime because of that. It, it may be that once they get above 15 to 20, maybe they would actually, the muscle mass might take off. Maybe if they're a natural person, they might actually end up having, you know, testosterone levels that are high enough that it actually has a substantial impact for them. Once they get above where they feel comfortable, body fat wise, they could, they're okay. Let's say that you know, for them, 10% is pretty low. The 10% is pretty low actually. Generally speaking, that's, you know, that's hard for people to maintain. They want to be in 10 to 12 range. For them, that puts their body, their, temp, their testosterone, you know, at four or 500 milligrams per deciliter. It's not great, you know, still quote unquote in range. But if they went up to 16 or 17, they'd be firing on, firing on all pistons, but they wouldn't like how they looked. They, maybe they get a little bit of a moon face because of the way they put their body fat and their water goes, whatever it may be. So that you, there may be some limitations that are just, based on the own, own person's psychology and the, what they're willing to do. Um, so you got to work with them with those parameters. And I think sometimes this is where a coach may actually come into play was where a coach says, okay, if you want to move up a weight class, I've, we've done a nice history here. You keep, here's what you keep on doing. You keep on bouncing between, you know, 7% and 12% and not gaining your muscle mass. We're going to have to go above that. We're going to have to go from, you know, this maybe better, what you think is a better ratio or a more acceptable way of looking to gaining more body fat, but gaining more muscle mass and then holding on to that for a period of time, maybe putting in some of those mechanisms like satellites, letting the satellite cells entrench themselves, so to speak, um, as new as, as uh, uh, DNA, as nuclei in, in, the, in the muscle fibers, that's some of the most, maybe the epigenetic factors come into play. So someone has those muscle memory mechanisms in place and get used to lifting the heavier loads in a way that you can hold on to that muscle. Yeah, it may have to stay there for a year. 
and may have to be sort of be a little bit bigger and rounder. And people ask you, so are you a power lifter? <laughs> no, I'm not. Well, oh, you look kind of like a big fat power lifter. <laughs> and I love power lifters. Don't get me wrong. I, those guys are fucking awesome. I love power lifters to death because they just want to get big and massive. It's just great and strong as shit, obviously. But so that's where a coach can, I think, can come in handy is to someone who can just tell you what you don't want to know or feel mm. and allow you to maybe delay your gratification in a way that you wouldn't otherwise. And it kind of depends on the person. Every once in a while, you know, you'll see someone who's just as like, I'm just going for it, you know? And the tough thing is that you will see some of the best bodybuilders in the world who have genetics, who can do all those same things and they get so much better results. They look giant and massive in clothes. They don't look fat, blah, blah, blah. And that that's, may not be you if you're trying to get where you're going to go. You may have to like sort of make a different kind of social psychological sacrifice in order to get that muscle mass. So what you want to do, though, if you're going to make that sacrifice is know that what you're doing is giving you the proceeds, so to speak, in terms of muscle mass that you're wanting to get. So body, the mirror will help with that. A coach can sort of say, you know, we're on the right track. Those strength gains can help with that too. So let's say you're the guy who was doing 200 pounds for whatever the exercise is for 10 reps. And now you say, you know what? And this is, uh, this is not a bad anchor to have in place. What was the rule of thumb? Um, benching three, pulling five, and squatting six. Something like that was the rule of thumb. You'll see um, uh, Confessions of an Unlikely Bodybuilder is a book. You know right. that? Yeah, you know that one? I think I've heard of it. I yeah. haven't read it. Oh, yeah. I, you, I think you'd like it. I think you'd enjoy it. Yeah, because he starts off as a natural competitor, and then he goes to the dark side, and like all sorts of, yeah, crazy shit happens to that guy. And But those are, the, those are some numbers that he had in his head, and he goes after those. It's one part of the book. It's been a while since I've read it. But you can say to yourself, you know what? If I can take all these lifts, 200 pounds, and I can change it into 300 pounds, I don't see anyone in my gym. Here's the guy who's doing 275, and he's ginormous. Every time I go to a gym, let's say it's an incline press, barbell press for, for 10 reps. You see guys doing 405, you know, who are just gi – like some of the biggest bodybuilders of all time are doing that sort of thing. But if you're doing 315 or 275 for a set of 10 on an incline barbell press, you've got a big chest. There's almost going to be no way around that. Now, it could be like the squat example, like someone's just squatting, and they – they get stronger, you know, and like Stan Efferding was an example of someone who's, you know, world's strongest bodybuilder who got better um, in terms of muscle mass when he went to higher reps, but he still had impressive performance. But for someone at that level who maybe is lacking in strength, that would be one thing to look at is just set those numbers in place. So I'm going to go until I'm strong enough to do, to increase my lifts, the weight I'm using for these reps by 50% on everything that is going to produce muscle mass. There's just really almost no way around it, everything else being equal. <clears throat> so the other way, of course, is the mirror and the coach. And then people want to do the body composition. They want to do body estimation. And the thing I have to say is that in order for someone to tell you what your true body composition is, they're going to have to kill you and tell you afterwards because it's not a direct measurement. It's always an estimate. And I cover this in my book. I've got an article actually on John Meadows' site where I go dig into this pretty deeply. But there's underlying assumptions behind all of these things um, that can invalidate them, especially for people who are extremely muscular um, and people who are extremely lean. So there's issues there just sort of scientifically. But what you can do to some degree is take a good measurement, take a measurement you can do, and it doesn't need to be one where you're actually trying to estimate your body fat percentage, but you can take your own measurements of body weight, strength, and skin folds, which just basically is telling you how thick the skin is over the areas that are the ones you're concerned about. So let's say you're a guy who gets the glutes come in decently well, but you've got that, you can't that, get that lower lat to tie in very well. The, 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 the love handles just are the last place to come in. And that's the first place to fill up with water when you, when you start to retain water, with fat as you gain fat. So that's going to be a place you're going to want to measure and know. So let's say you pick that, a PEC, and like an ab measurement. Those wouldn't be standardized measures that you would use. 
they might be used in some body fat estimation equations in place, but it doesn't matter because you're not trying to truly get an estimate, an actual number. You're wanting to know how you personally are doing, relatively speaking. And you can't actually go and do a DEXA measurement though. Hmm. Dual mission. Have you had someone on to talk about body comp on the show? And Actually not. It's come up lots of times, okay. but not yeah. specifically touchy on all of it. Yeah, it, it would be a great, I mean, I'm trying to think of, probably find someone. I, it's one of my kind of favorite topics too. We can maybe do another podcast and talk about it sometime. But that's a measurement that you can get done and relatively. If you go to women's clinics, they'll have them available. It's, it was really sort of done. They're, they're purchased a lot of times by hospitals to do estimate of bone mineral density to evaluate osteoporotic um, fracture risks and those sorts of things, effectiveness of drugs for reducing that risk, that sort of thing. But it does a great job of also giving you body composition measurements. That's why you see it used so often. It actually gives people numbers that are a little bit higher than what they expected otherwise. So it's kind of a, um, a truth sayer to some degree there. But what, you, what someone can do is get a DEXA measurement and assume that's a realistic evaluation of how much fat-free mass you have or lean body mass, they call it in that estimation, which reflects your muscle mass. So that's sort of your objective baseline. That's your validated measurement. And then you can use your own skin folds and see how your skin folds change in those places where you hold the body fat that is the last to come off when you diet down, the first to come, up, come on when you, when, you diet, when you gain weight in the off season, and develop your own way of estimating what that DEXA would tell you if you went in and paid $100 for one. And develop your own, and I have a little graph, I demonstrate how to do this in the, in the Be Your Own Bodybuilding Coach book, you probably saw that. And you can actually create your own kind of regression equation. All you have to do is like plot the data and just do it on a piece of paper if you wanted to. You don't even have to get a regression equation and get an idea. So what you will what you will know then is like you start off and let's say you're say so you're just keep the numbers simple, you're hundred kilos and your total of your skin folds is 30 millimeters for those three sites that you've personally chosen as a guy. A woman would do different sites. And that puts you at um, let's just say 10%. So you're 90, 90 kilos of lean body mass, 10 kilos of body fat. So just break it down that way. I'm not gonna worry about bone, all that kind of thing. And then you go and you make measurements with the DEXA a year later, and it tells you you've got 10 more kilos of lean body mass, and but your body fat's this with this these skin folds. You can then plot that, and you can start to develop um, an evaluation of, for yourself of what it means when you gain body fat in terms of weight and lean body mass. So if you, for instance, come back, let's say two years later, you've been just keeping these measurements, you're going in every year and getting a DEXA done, but you're doing skin folds. I use these for check-ins with clients. A lot of people do. They're very, very helpful. In the context of all the other things, just kind of nice to see. Because you see where the fat's coming on and off. Yeah. You see in the pictures, and you see in the skin folds as well. So it's an objective number that, sort of bypasses that brain. As long as you've gotten good at making those or your partner, you can do them very consistently. You're getting a good idea where that needs to be. So you come back two years later and now you're again, it just so happens that you end up at 30 millimeters. You've been doing these skin folds now for three years. You're really good at them. And your 30 millimeters, that tells you that the layer of subcutaneous skin of, of fat, about the same, mm -hmm. but you're way 10 kilos more. That's a victory. That's a good thing. The body fat percentage, who knows? Who knows? There could be all sorts of things, but you, you've just done a very nice job of, of putting on fat-free mass. That's you know, 20 pounds in two years, 22 pounds in, in two years. That's phenomenal. That'd be great. It'd be awesome. So then you see what happens. Let's say you get one the week before a show or the week after a show if you've been able to keep from rebounding. Now you know what it is, what you need to be when you're shredded. Right. Everything is like two to four millimeters, like the skin of the back of your hand. You can reach down and grab the, your glute anywhere. It all feels like this. Then you know you're ready. That's where you want to be. So you go in the mirror one day and you look in the, in the gym and it's a body dysmorphia day. And you're like, oh my God, I look <laughs> fat. I just been looking at all these pictures of John Meadows and Tom Platts and all these guys with Rich Gasparro's guys with shredded glutes. And I'm like, 
I'm just nowhere close. But you do your skin folds that morning when you wake up, you do it objectively, you're not looking in that mirror, the dysmorphia hasn't kicked in, and you're like a millimeter away on all of those sites or two millimeters, you're like, okay, I've done this before. I've dieted down. It takes me about, I lose about a millimeter each week. And the last one to come in is my low back. I need to get my low back to five millimeters. And then I know I'm as shred as I can possibly get. That's how it is. And that's there. And pretty much, I mean, obviously there's going to be, you know, some discrepancies, but once you get that five millimeters there, you're shredded. No matter how much your brain tells you you're, you're fat, you don't, you're, not, you're gonna get decimated, you're gonna be pretty close. You're in at least shooting range. So that in of itself can reduce your stress, increase your confidence, make you think I'm doing the right thing here because look what's happening. I, I went from eight weeks out at 12 mil, millimeters to seven weeks later, one week before, and I'm at five millimeters. That's about you know one millimeter a week, seven millimeters from 12 to five over seven weeks. That's phenomenal. That's exactly what you'd expect. That's what you want. That's what happened before. That was a good progress. So now I know next time I diet down that if I'm thinking I can be at 20 millimeters at nine weeks out, I've got some work ahead of me. I may need to pick a different show. And I've done that too, thinking like, oh, you know, I'm leaner than I thought I was. Um, like, like one thing that is like when I moved, it's been a while now, when I moved from Arizona to Florida, I lost that gym that I could always go into, which where the lighting was always a horrible fluorescent lighting, but it's the same mirrors, same gym, always look the same. I have comparison shots there, you know, over, over for a decade, literally, I didn't have that anymore. I couldn't go back and look at that. So this is, this is objective one you can take with you. Um, just as an aside on, on on photos, um, I always suggest people either, ideally you pick a place that isn't giving you ambient sunlight where you have all control over all the lighting. Now, if yeah. you want to do an Instagram photo, you know, go stand next to a window in your hotel and it looks badass and it's very cool. You know, and you can see that. As long as you can see details you didn't know were there, that might help as a confidence booster. But as far as for a coach or for your coaching yourself, having control over that lighting with the same angle, everything else is I think super important. And, and ideally, depending on how sort of, um, you know, psychologically resilient you are, the worse lighting you have, the better. <laughs> because if you look good, no matter what the lighting, then you're going to look good no matter what the lighting. And, you know, you keep doing like, like the magic mirror in the Middle East at Oxygen Gym, you know, it's like, no one ever looks as good. Like we know yeah. this now, like that mirror is like, it's got the, it's a circus mirror and the lighting is amazing, et cetera. And I just saw a video popped up on my YouTube. I don't, I don't, didn't click on it, but it was something about Instagram heroes, you know, uh, Instagram versus stage. Yeah. And you know, you see it, you can see it and stage photos almost never like there's some photographers who do a good job with this, but sometimes it, it just never pick up on the things you see in real life. I've just been to enough, you know, hundreds of shows to know this. You don't always get the same thing, but as far as the individual, having consistent so there's consistency there that skin fold idea is we're not trying to get an estimate of body fat it's not like so you can go around and say you know i'm 4.7 percent body fat i think i should win it's it's not that um although there was my very first show there was a guy who went around saying what do you think my body fat percentage is oh, God. Like, i don't know it was very odd i was like what is this guy doing so um you literally like he may have been a little bit wackadoodle in the head right. too. So I don't, I don't know, but so um, let's see what else. If I missed anything, help me see I, it here. I can, uh, can I chuck some questions potentially? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It was on the lighting. It's actually really interesting. I literally did a whole podcast, I think with Cliff Wilson on how to take photos oh. just because uh, as I'm coaching more and more competitors, I'm getting, and I try and get them to standardize it. Sometimes they're good with it. Other times they're not. And I just wanted to know kind of, he's coached tons of people and like yourself, kind of how do you set that up to get the best and most honest and helpful lighting? Cause yeah, I don't know. I've had people who have had the brightest light at them. They're really pale. And then I'm like, I, I can't really see, like you said, daylight coming in so inconsistent. Uh, so I don't know if you, do you have like a, 
your favorite way of setting it up. I, I kind of tried some like artificial lighting. So having like a ring light and kind of using that with a bit of overhead lighting seemed to be a nice mix. But I don't know if you've got your preferred standard approach. Well, in, in my mind, I mean, how, how you, I, I've got, I think my eye, I mean, maybe I'm pumping myself, but I think my eye is good enough that I can detect the changes as long as it's not like, they're just like blasted, like with, you know, 9,000 watt lighting. And like, all you see is like this ghost with some eyes, you know, like <laughs> yes. you can't see anything. Um, but as long as the lighting is, you know, reasonable, I can see what changes are happening. So, I mean, I will, I'll literally look at that lighting and I'll see what's going on there. I'll look at the skin fold. This is why having multiple measurements are so helpful. Yep. And I'll look at the body weight. And I'll also ask about strength in the gym. And one thing I didn't cover is perceived recovery status. That's important to help auto-regulate things. How are you feeling as well? So if you feel like it could be that the strength loss and, and maybe even water retention could be a function of cortisol and stress, and that will affect your weight. So if your, peer, if your perceived recovery has gone from I use a zero to 10 scale from a nine or eight, which is great, down to all of a sudden a five, and you didn't sleep, and you're doing, and your posing is just like this, you're not hitting your poses very hard. Like all those things would tell you, okay, I'm not going to worry too much about any of this because this person feels like dog crap. And they're not, they're not training hard, they're not resting well, they're retaining water, et cetera, et cetera. But other than that, as far as the pictures go, I like consistency is the absolute, for me, the absolutely most important thing. And what matters, as I said, is not how you look. It's not like you submit pictures, you know, here's me in my um, bathroom, you know, uh, who looks best? And they, you know, flash them across the screen and the judges pick the one they like. <laughs> It's, it's where you are, if, if you've gotten your conditioning where it's supposed to be, and I don't, I haven't worked with really bikini competitors, I'll just help some people that I know, but I really haven't done that. So I'm talking about mainly competitors who are, there's no limit on, on how lean you get to be. You can be as, you know, peeled beyond, beyond hum, humanity, then you should look that way everywhere. And that skill skin fold should match up. So we're looking for like just absolutely utterly diced all the time at every angle, almost under all lighting where you can see any level of definition. And then when you pick good lighting, you know, if someone would want to send you that, then you look just like mind boggling. So I know I don't, and you know, it's funny because a lot of times, you know how clients can be sometimes they just will change things out of nowhere because, and, and it's because they want, because it's, there's a, it's a body dysmorphia things like, ah, yeah. I'm not like, I don't like how I'm looking and they're, they're, they're looking for stage photos or when the lighting's better and they want to look that way. And I try to like keep people away from those. So keep you on the, same, on the same lighting as best you can. Like I said, with that gym back in Arizona, um, I, I, the, the place that I go now is a gym. And it, it has open air lighting, but that's just the only place I can really do it in that gym and it works out pretty well. So I do photos and video there. Um, so no, no particular, it's kind of a, up to the person. I like video better than pictures. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's easier for a lot of people. They're not running back and forth, you know, stopping. They can just video. And that way I can evaluate their posing as well. Mm -hmm. And there's so much to that. Yeah. And you don't want to have a client who's like taking 10 photos and sending you the best one. And in the meantime, you know, they're just fumbling around with their posing and their transitions are terrible. So, you know, you know, like uh, there have been several times when I'm like, you know what? I, th I think you should try to find a local posing coach. Yeah. I can help you as much as I want and I will, I'll be happy to, but it may end up being like an, a total extra expense. So video with consistent lighting, which is going to have to be indoors away from any ambient lighting. So if it's a crappy dark day, you don't look different than it's yeah. a nice sunny day. And over the course of the year, things will change. If you take your photos at at 8 a.m., there may be the sun may be up or not up, depending on what time of the year it is. So that will change things, even if everything else is the same. So for me, it's consistency and then knowing that you're going to, if we get you where you need to be, you're going to be shredded no matter what the lighting is. Yes. Hey, nice. Pascal here. I just wanted to take the moment to talk about our membership site. Inside, you'll find a thriving forum, an extensive exercise library, courses, presentations, and research reviews. All I need you to do is hit the link in the description below and sign up. See you there. Yeah, so, no, I, I like that. Yeah. I, I, and it makes, makes a, a ton of sense as well, I think. And thankfully, 
I can't even imagine what it must have been. I guess online coaching is relatively new, but now the cameras on like iPhones or whatever you've got, they're great. Like the, the cameras are amazing. Whereas yeah. previously, like you're getting all the, like these squarey or like not very detailed images and you're like, uh, is that a striation or is that like a pixel? <laughs> right. You know, it's funny. Go, go listen to some of like Chad Nichols stuff. He's talked about like what he would do with like Ronnie and Flex. Those guys, they would actually, uh, they would FedEx Polaroids. Amazing. You know, the, the yeah. Polaroid comes out, you know, and they put him in an envelope. And so there's like a two day delay. And like, they're, they're FedExing this. Like, I don't know what, probably 40 bucks, you know, to send a little packet, like two day, you know, or next day air and take two days. And then he'd make the adjustments based on that. That's, you know? a, that's so, crazy. <laughs> and now we can get like literally, you can literally FaceTime with someone on the yeah. day of the show, you know, or whatever in another country across, around the world and, and do it instantaneously. So. How are you for time, Scott? I know we didn't discuss oh. how long. Are you all good? Yeah, yeah. This is all. Cool. This is this is this is the most important thing and part of my day, man. So awesome, great. Yeah, uh, yeah I don't know. We were talking about the perceived recovery scale, and you mm. talked about it being naught to ten. Where kind of what's a five compared to a ten? What's uh, for people who are listening? Five is not good. so. I've got this. Let me pull it up on my. Um, I'll read it to you. Pull it up on my site here. The scale, and I talk about this in my book. It's been validated in the context of um, muscle performance in sort of a muscle soreness type of scenario. Let me pull it up. And it's, it's anchored, it's a Likert scale. Here we go. And if you go to drscottstevenson.com and the, there's some links at the top, the resources for Be Your Own Bodybuilding Coach. So when you can click on, and then I've got a, I've got a, we might as well talk about a personal bodybuilding inventory. It's a PDF form you can download. It's basically kind of an intake form. It's not based on the intake form that I've used for years where people can actually put their goals in all the things that, that I would gather information wise so they can assess themselves and reassess themselves as they're going through and shifting mm -hmm. from post uh, contest to off season to pre contest. And so this perceived discovery scale has the zero to 10 and it's, it's a very generalized one. So it's not like, you know, tell me about how this muscle feels. Um, th that would actually also require some auto regulation and some, you know, some insight, but it's just sort of a general, you could say it's probably related to the nervous system, but it does specifically relate to performance in muscles that have been sort of trained, um, and damaged intentionally and how the extent to which muscle strength recovers in that sort of a, a, of a scenario. I've got some references there to, um, to back up and show you some of the origins of this thing, but zero to zero is very poorly recovery, ex recovered, extremely tired, zero to two, you're going to expect decline performance. So okay. you're basically in what well, technically at that point would be considered an overtrained state where your performance is going down. Um, Middle of the scale is about four to six from somewhat to adequately to moderately recover and you're going to expect similar performance. So you're sort of staying, you know, where, um, where you are, not where you want to be if you're trying to grow, especially in the off season, because you're hoping to go up, move upwards in your performance if we're taking the form follows function notion. Seven is just above that and eight, nine and 10 is well recovered, somewhat energetic. 10 is very well recovered, highly energetic. Here's where you can expect improved performance. So I try to keep people in the seven to 10 pretty much all the time, as much as possible in that range. So and I can send you a link or, or we can, the, um, the actual scale itself. People can just download it there and see it. But yeah, I like that. It's really, really helpful um, because part, part of, um, Part of being your own coach is, is trying to be honest with yourself. And part of having a coach and making a coach valuable is you have to be honest with the coach. Mm -hmm. And some people are like, hey, you tell me what to do, I'll do it. I don't care. Like, you know, people would say, sometimes I've had people ask me, hey, can you coach me? I'm like, well, I coach the people who basically would do just about anything. And, I, and I'd say, you know, imagine I said, I want you to go out between every set into the parking lot there and have a handful of gravel. And you're saying, and that my, my clients would say, should it be my le left hand or my right hand? And I'd say <laughs> both. And they, and they should, should it be gravel with glass or no glass in it. 
and, and I'll say, that's your choice, alternate, and say, okay, done. Like, that's kind of the level, but, and that level of commitment also goes hand in hand with being very, very stoic very yeah. often and not being honest. So if you dictate that you have to be honest with me as to what your recovery status is, that's a check-in point. And if you're not honest, then you're not, you're not being a good, you're not, you know, fulfilling your end of the deal. Mm-hmm then this tells you, it's like, okay, we're going to have to take, we're going to have to do a deload or if we're four to two training, we're going to do an intensive cruise. We're going to step back or a refeed, or we're going to make whatever adjustments the coach or the person might feel are needed. So it's, it's a way of forcing some internal introspective subjective evaluation of the person's recovery status into the coaching scene, into the, out in the open. So you say, okay, and I, like, how are you feeling? I feel great. Like how many, how many times do you lie about that? Like, especially during prep all the time. How are you doing? Awesome. It's like, <laughs> I'm fucking hungry all day long. I haven't slept more than an hour for the last week and I feel awesome. You're so full of it. Your recovery might be like a four. Well, you probably need to do something about that, figure yeah. out some solutions. So that's, I think that's a real important one because that's going to guide, you know, how you periodize things. If you're using an auto regulatory approach, um, it's gonna, it's gonna tell you whether maybe that's why you're starting to lose, lose ground in making progress if, yeah. if you're pre-contest or why you, maybe you've, maybe you've taken, you know, an increased volume type of approach, um, over your training regime and, and you're just sort of, this is what they, everyone says I should do. This is what Mike suggested people would do generally, but maybe this just doesn't work for me. Mm-hmm. And I, I can't really tell cause I'm not going to like to failure on all these and I haven't Doing these other, done these other things and my rec- perceived recovery is terrible. Like I didn't even realize until I looked at that scale. I'm like, oh, t- this is bad. So, or it's really good. Like now it's time to go for it. So yeah. uh, it's very, very helpful. Stro- I've been using it now for three or four years at least. And it's just great. It's like, it's one of the most important measurements I think that I have because it's, yeah. it's, it's one of the best ways for me to sort of objectively get inside the head of the trainee in a way that they can't necessarily, because they might even be able to make that evaluation, give me a PRS score, but they don't know what to do with it. And they don't, it doesn't sink in, in a way that they can then objectively engineer into a strategy to change training volume or food or find a a sleep remedy or whatever it might be that you need to adjust. So. It's, that's an important one. To, to, uh, so if your progress is this, this interacts with progress in all these, in all these domains sort of simultaneously, I think. Um, so if you're not making progress and your PRS is five, we'll go figure. Yeah. I, I really like it because it particularly because it's something similar I, I have used within my own kind of coaching in that I have like a, a readiness score. So when okay. someone goes in to do like a certain muscle group sets bench press, they're kind of, yes. are they fresh going in? Are they fatigued or are they okay? That's like my three markers. And I'm using a similar sort of, it's a similar sort of concept to auto-regulate volume. And like you said, looking into why are they feeling fatigued if they're fatigued or whatever it is. And like you oh, said there, People like it because they're like, I never used to think about these things. I just go and do whatever my program is on paper and mm-hmm. I wouldn't change anything according to how I felt. So yeah, it's so important. It's like, it's, it feels really now like a basic fundamental thing, but right. it's something people ignore because they just follow whatever's on the paper in front of them. And there's, there's so many, yeah, there's so many things that's, I, I understand like turning over the reins to your coach and being a soldier, so to speak. Some, sometimes that's kind of what you need to do because you're a lot of times you're fighting, you're fighting so many internal <laughs> desires to eat and yeah. rest, you know, reduce your needs, conserve your energy, et cetera. So you have to do things that are, are, are counter to your nature. Um, but then we also end up tuning out things like when you go in and like, I, I'm, you know, it's not my first rodeo. I need to stretch a little bit when I go in the gym, I don't stretch very hard, but I, I always stretch out and I can tell how sore I am when I start to stretch. I won't yeah. necessarily know that during the day because I, I probably habitually avoid using some of those muscles that are really sore. I don't squat down as much because their legs are sore. They're too sore, but paying attention with a, with a readiness score like that, like when you're, when you're warming up or like one of the ones that like, especially like seasoned guys, I'm sure you probably experienced this too, is 
you go in and you pull that first 20 kilo pound plate, 20 kilo plate off the tree and it feels like a tiddly wink. You're like, it's going to be a good day today. <laughs> this feels light. Everything is like, is that the right? Yep, that's the right weight. Okay, you just throw it on the bar and you're good to go. So that's all in that readiness. That's all yeah. there. Um, and I had, uh, I usually, you know, I'm doing fortitude training. So half of the days are full body days. I'm training everything three times a week. And, um, I was traveling and I was sort of in need of a, an intensive cruise. And I actually, so I switched to that and I took a day off of leg training, which I hadn't had for a while, or I sort of missed when I had an extra day of rest, two days of rest. And I came in and trained legs just yesterday and I was looking for it. I was paying attention. I'm like, so we're going to see, like, I, I knew I needed to do that. And I, when I went into stretch, I'm like, oh, this is so much different. This is just, it was a world of difference. And I was paying attention to that very, very closely because I paid attention to it the day previous time I trained legs and paid attention to that time. And, and the day when I didn't train, I didn't, I, I made sure I didn't. And it was so confirming. It was that readiness was just so obvious. So I think yeah. once you've gotten in tune with that as a coach and once clients or individuals start realizing that there's all sorts of things that you can change literally on the fly. And this is one of the hardest things that, people don't want to do um is you like you get you go to the gym and like your mindset is like today it's me versus gravity and gravity's going to lose and so you you put on the warriors you know helmet and you're ready to go to battle and sometimes the battle is going to be not in decimating yourself yeah and uh and paying attention so that's why i have in like fortitude training i have three volume tiers and it's okay to auto-regulate on the fly. It's like, you know what? I've been doing volume tier three. I've been handling this, but I went in today. And I still, I think I still can train. My PRS is still an eight, you know, so I'm still overly, I'm ready, but I'm, I'm pretty sore. So I feel sort of cognitively, neurologically, mood-wise ready for a good training session. But the musculature, so the readiness, I think the way you're using it has, is, is offset from that. I'm sleeping good, eating well but the muscle hasn't recovered. So I'm gonna jump down, I'm gonna go to tier one even. I'm gonna train like a madman because I have the capacity to do that. My, psycho my psyche's there for that. And I'm gonna just eat every little bit of stimulus out of these sets that I do. Get in, get it done, and get out and be done. And that's not weakness, that's not no. like bailing. Um, that's not a violation of the program. That's part of the program. That's training smart and training hard at the same time. And when you have, when you're paying attention to your muscular readiness as an auto regulating that regard, as well as using a generalized global perceived recovery scale, you can combine those two things and, and literally on the fly coach yourself or like if you're with a client say, okay, here's, so here's what I want to make sure you do this week because your PRS is getting low. You're getting to that eight range. And if, if you like, let's say you have someone normally they do, I want you to drop. And I think this is what, what Chris Aceto does as far as training. Mm -hmm. He doesn't really do much, but he just says, let's just say like, you know, cut your sets in half this week. Cause he knows people he's, he's working with are training like crazy men or women, no matter what, I think it's almost all guys these days, but so he knows they're going to train hard. So he just cuts their volume back. Cause you could just say, you know, do two thirds as many sets or just do two thirds as many exercises. I know how, how, how hard you're going to train and that's the dictate. You do it because that's what you're supposed to do or you do it because your readiness scale has told you to do that in combination with your PRS rating. So yeah, that's, and that's, that's super important for monitoring progress and keeping progress going um, because otherwise you head into that not well recovered zone and that's over training land. Unless you're, unless you're trying to be fancy and produce a functional overreaching effect, which you can do, in the off season more effectively, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah. You got to be really careful of that. So yeah. So that's, that's a really, um, that's one of the hardest ones for, for athletes and people with, you know, a bodybuilding mindset to, to, to do. Um, I always struggle with it. I, if yeah. I always say, man, if I could just, if I could do train 10 hours a day, I would, it'd be great. <laughs> Literally go in there, train all the time. It'd be awesome. You know, and just grow. Like the more you did, the more you grew, how great would that be? I'll just outwork everybody, you know. I'll just, I'll just be like, you just need to train eat more. all day long. <laughs> Say what? Just need to eat more. It's fine. Yeah, exactly. I'll just, 
<laughs> just bring, you know, bring a, bring a cooler in with me to the gym and just eat and train, and eat and train and, you know, take naps between sets, whatever it takes. <laughs> and I, like, no, I, I, I completely see it. And I, I see it with myself and clients and uh, people out there. And I guess this is why some people don't even like, you've got that intensive cruise similar to maybe a deload. And some mm -hmm. people just take days off the gym because they probably can't trust themselves to just cruise. Um, right. They're going to take it too far. Uh, but at least people are becoming, they're realizing there is some accumulated fatigue. We have to get rid of this before we can carry on with our journey. Whereas, mm -hmm. yeah, it's the same with kind of taking maybe a, a refeed or a diet break or something where actually you need to increase food so you can kind of keep the diet going. A lot of people struggle with that. Yeah, the hardest, the hardest thing I think is sort of be honest with yourself. You know, the, the thing with the refeeds is like, do you really need a refeed or is that just sort of the thing to do? <laughs> You know, it'd be very tough and seeing like what actually is happening, like paying attention to that. So like, the, for instance, the best example I know of is the intensive cruiser fortitude training was it's basically kind of like a taper. Yeah. Um, so you, you keep your efforts high and you reduce the volume. And I've sort of prescribed the duration of that based on how long you've been progressively blasting. It's there's some, a, somewhat of a formula, but it's based on, my experience and what I read in the literature sort of combined those things. And that was in part reactive to what people were doing when I was Dante Trudell's sort of official DC trainer for years. So he would send clients to me and I would administer the DC training principles the best I could. And, and he very much left that up to the individual, which what they do during their cruise, which is totally fine. There was just a large subset of people who just didn't, Sometimes they regress. There was a, a people that kept on saying, you know, I'd make these gains and then I'd just, then I'd just be like so crazy wiped out and they'd just like take two weeks off, do nothing. And then it'd take them like, you know, six of the next eight weeks to get back to where they once yeah. were. And I'm like, that's not good. You know, you're taking four steps forward and three steps back. Let's see if we can figure this. So I, I went to the, what I found worked and those things and I put, put them together and what I think works better on average. It works really, really well for many people. But some people may need to take that time off. And some people may need only a few days off, but a period of reduced volume. Some people may need to go in and just, you know, leave three or four reps in the tank, three or four reps in reserve on those sets, just in training the same amount of volume. Um, there's all sorts of, there's a multitude of ways you can do that. And I haven't yeah. seen that really dug into um, very much. Good, good coaches in like the strength and power sports know this, you know that everyone's going to be different. Um, like someone who pops in, you know who Guy Cistronino is? I haven't heard. I, I don't recognize okay. him. Great, great guy. He's an IFBB 212 pro. He's a maniac. He does way too much. <laughs> he's talked about this. I've talked about it with him. He's actually changing his training now because he's beating himself up so much. But for him, before – and he's – I think he's won like – I want to say he said he's won seven pro shows as a 212-er. Wow. Over the years, yeah, he's a really good 212. He's been the top six in Olympia. Um, he's qualified this year. I hope he does really well. He's gone through a bunch of shit, but he literally trains like right up to the show. Just keeps everything the same. Like the day before the show, he'll train with his regular because because that's he keeps doing what he's been doing. He's going to keep getting what he's been getting. He likes to train that way. That just suits him. That's good for his mindset. If if he were just like if they said okay, just no take three days and just sit in your hotel and, you know, let your glycogen refill. Like you just go crazy. Yeah. You just lose his mind. So some people literally can't, they would not benefit in an off season or any context from a, a completely away from the gym deload, you know, and, and in some cases there may be sort of an obsessive compulsive aspect that, that may, might be addressed as well. It's like, okay, you don't got to train every day, you know, twice a day, six or seven days a week. We can let's go. Let's tr first work on that and get you into like some range of normalcy. But then there's some variation in how someone's physiology performs, how well they can evaluate that PRS. Yeah. So you know, some people. Um, I always tell the story. Of, it's it's sort of related to uh, PRS is is the way people evaluate pain. In my experience, in doing pain measurements as a scientist, we did used to do a lot of muscle soreness, muscle pain measurements and I, I'll give it make it brief I've told the story multiple times but there's a kid who came through um, a large study we did we tested nearly 100 maybe it was 120 
students um, uh, doing a kind of a large scale delayed onset muscle soreness pain study. And this one particular, we're doing strength measurements and we're doing um, various measurements of pain while walking, that sort of thing. And then a pressure algometry measurement, you press on the muscle at the point of most soreness. And it was a zero to hundred millimeter scale that they, they swipe across. And normally you'd see greater strength loss was more pain. Some of that strength loss is just because it hurts to exert themselves and the muscles damage. So you don't have the contract elements. Well, this, this guy suffered a huge loss of strength. We just seen that tested. And so it wasn't completely blinded just for the purposes. We had so many, you know, things going on, all these people coming through and his pain measurements, like it doesn't even really hurt. Like, it doesn't hurt at all. And I'm like, how can it not hurt? Like he's, his strength is way down, you know? And I asked him afterwards, I said, Hey, have you had some unusual experiences with pain? He's like, yeah, I was kind of a daredevil. Um, and I had some heart issues when I was a kid. He had open heart surgery like two or three times where they just cut through your rib cage, which was really painful. And he said once he was trying to jump his BMX bike over a wrought iron fence with like the, the spike posts on it, and he didn't quite make it, and he impaled himself. He was lying there impaled for like a couple hours before someone found him. That's pain. That's yeah. real pain. So you made my muscle sore by picking up some weights? That doesn't hurt. So take that to receive recovery. And someone who's been in the military, let's say they're, yeah. you know, they've been a, a ranger or a special forces, wherever they may live. Or, you know, they just work, you know, crazy hours with heavy for them, you know, they may never really get to a true 10 because they just live on a different plane of recovery. So they may need to do very different things during a deload than someone who is very sensitive. It's like, oh, you know, I got a, a, an hour less of sleep last night. I feel terrible. I don't want to do anything today. I'm calling in from work. And I'm not disparaging people like, you know, who may, may, maybe aren't as hardcore as that, but the way they evaluate those things subjectively, even they're doing their best job and the way then they're just their physiology is, even if that subjective component was there. So you've got these two aspects, just broadly speaking of how the mind is perceiving recovery and what the body is actually capable of recovering from and the extent to which recovery can happen during various forms of deloading or refeeding or recovery strategies that's, that are gonna vary. So what you do during a deload or an intensive cruise or a, a refeeding period or whatever it might be could vary so much person to person. So there's no, again, no strict formula. Um, sorry, no black and white answers for you, <laughs> except draw, do your best to figure out. You know, yeah. and sometimes, sometimes you gotta do things that are just, you wouldn't even, wouldn't even believe. Uh, here's here's another story i just like I'd like to share these so i played um uh football in college i was not in college in high school and um i was like the only dummy who did all the drills and all the weight training for everything you know it's like it's like a, the guy that gave us a he gave us a four-hour weight training regime it was 100 <laughs> sets in a session full body three times a week and I'm the only one who did it because I'm like, hey, I'm, I want to win, you know, and I like training. and I, I just love the training part. And so we went, I'd done that for like a summer and I went in and I, the second game of the year, I got a thigh bruise and I, so I got, I really couldn't walk and I got really sick and I was laid up in bed. I didn't go to school. So I just, I was felt awful. I didn't hardly eat anything, but I stopped and I recovered and I rebounded. And I went in a week later and we were just doing like an in-season weight training maintenance regime. And my strength levels went up like 30 or 40 percent. Every and I and I, literally I was injured and like I had, you know, maybe five thousand calories over the course of a whole week. I chose I was really, really sick. But I've been doing so much. I've been pushing so hard previously. I was in such a state of, you know, barely being able to survive. But my mind was used to this. I'm like, oh, tell me what I got to do and I'll do it. I didn't realize that. I, a lot of people, well, no one else was doing that. I mean, it's just sort of the way, no one else was silly enough to try to do that. Like, this is bullshit. Why are we going to do this? But I did it because that's what the strength coach said. He knows better than me, right? So, and I just stopped. Who would, I would never have thought that I could get stronger by just literally yeah. lying on the couch for a week. But I did. That was the, that was the most, that was the highest rate of strength gain that I've ever experienced in my entire life. And it came from being completely sedentary, bed, literally bedridden 
and horribly sick. And I wonder how, why I got sick, right? <laughs> um, but I got stronger and I recovered. So you never know um, what the person, what might be best for them. So a lot of times if things aren't working, say, like, well, we've tried all these things here. We've tried like, you know, a subtle deload and dropping your volume by 25%, keeping the efforts high. Let's see what happens if we just drop you down by like 75%. You know, or let's say we do nothing for five days, hang in there with me for give me five days and let's go back in and test your weights, you know, and go back and the person goes up, you know, they, they go from 12, 12 reps with 200 pounds to 18 in five days of doing nothing because you got them to do that. I'll tell, here's a story from, in, from, from fortitude training. This was um, one of my early clients, the person who did it in the early, when I just came with the book and he was a math math teacher from the UK he used to teach like high-end calculus to advanced students and he trained really hard older guy knew how to train and we pushed the food big time with him he was literally and he followed everything to the T he followed my intensive cruise um, formula in the way it set it out but he had never really had a deload yeah like ever he'd never done that before He's a mathematics teacher, so numbers are his thing. Like he's very mathematically inclined. He's using a logbook. He comes in after after he's gone through his cruise and he's going back to the loading set, the big heavy straight set, and he figures, well, this is what I did before. You know, should have gotten stronger. I feel better. You know, good to go. So he picked a little bit higher load, or if it was if his reps were at the end, the bottom of the rep range. So I'll just stick with that. See if I can go from you know eight reps to eleven or twelve reps. He started doing like sets of 10, what he was doing for sets of 10 for like 25 reps. He was like doubling his reps. And he's like, he told me, he's like, Scott, I felt embarrassed. I'm like, yeah. I, ca I can't keep a logbook. Like what's, what's wrong with me? Like why, why? I like, I can't, like, can't write numbers down. He's thinking I, or I can't load a bar properly. Like what's going on? But it happened the first day he went in and then he went in, did the legs the first day and it happened with his upper body lifts the next time he went in the train and it was because he'd never had a deload before he had all this untapped into potential for muscle growth that he was basically keeping um, under wraps because he was just doing too much he wasn't yeah. wasn't deloading he wasn't he was training too too much or at least too consistent without taking a deload and it took that like extraordinary circumstance for him to realize that and it just blew his mind he just the he wouldn't let go of the idea because He's such a numbers person too, you know? So the recovery thing is, can't be, um, can't be overstated. I don't think, cause it's yeah. just so, so underappreciated and, and you can't like, it's, it's like, it's like the, if there were another color of the spectrum that you could never have never seen before. Um, there actually are people who can see colors that are is outside the, outside the normal visible spectrum. Yeah. I would think women in particular have a higher rate oh. of this particular. Yeah. It's like the matrix receptor. seeing yeah through. they can see in the ultraviolet <laughs> or something like that yeah which would be pretty cool so all of a sudden like you see this there's no wonder you couldn't have seen it before because your, your subjective measure of where you're supposed to be like how sore you're supposed to be of how your recovery is supposed to be and you, you may only see that if you do something totally different and remove the veil and yeah. just say okay well what i've been doing just hasn't worked the way i would have hoped i'm going to just try something that just sounds just silly and stupid I'm going to actually not train for a week, <laughs> see what happens. And boom, if you grow well, it's like, okay, it's there. And you have to believe it, you know, not go back to your ways, but a coach yeah. can help with that or just, just being a little bit braver than maybe yeah. you've been in the past. So anyway, uh, there's lots, I, lots to be said there, but. Hi nice. guys, Steve here. Just wanted to take a moment of your time to remind you of our online coaching service. At Revive Stronger, we pride ourselves on providing personalized service that will take your physique and knowledge to the next level. If you're interested, check the description and sign up. No, I think that's, I think it's great because, yeah, for, I mean, at least from a coaching perspective, you definitely have the clients where you know you need to push them or, and especially those you need to pull back and save them from themselves. And I think it's really easy for people to get a new normal of, like they're a low body fat percentage, they're maintaining it and they're like, oh yeah, this is normal. And then they eat more and they're like, oh wow, this is what actually feeling good feels like. Or right. like you said, they're training really hard all the time, not really 
allowing themselves to recover and they just think that's normal and then they're forced to take a bit of time off and it's like oh this is what feeling recovered look like looks like Mm -hmm. and this is what can happen when i let that happen so i think that's really well stated and i don't know if i think we've covered pretty much all your monitoring tools i don't know if you had anything else you wanted to cover there scott yeah i wrote i made some notes here uh yeah that's it my man and i think it was really comprehensive and I, I love digging into these because I think on paper, it all looks really like simple, like take your weight, whatever. Um, and But it's when you bring it all together and you talk about the importance of all of these and also like being self-coached and kind of looking into trying different things and experimenting a little bit. I think that's where that kind of, that's where that kind of be your own bodybuilding coach really flourishes is that it allows people to try a little bit more outside the box maybe. So yeah, I want to thank you for being on the show and kind of yeah. yeah chatting to me for two hours already appreciate it let me throw one more thing that just occurred to me too about all those measures just in a global way is that what it also when you do all those at one time you should see a consistent picture yeah and so sometimes you'll if something's inconsistent it will tell you it can give you information that you didn't know that you needed to have that would be helpful and the one that popped in my head was body weight measurements especially with women so women tend to have a lot more fluctuation in water. That's, of course, the monthly lunar yeah. cycle, so to speak. But some people will have body weight fluctuations when they, because they're traveling or what have you. So if you're doing like weekly body weight check-ins with those skin folds, and those things don't seem to be adding up, like the body weight goes up. Or usually they go in, in conjunction, but things just don't like – it's just not an appropriate coupling or, or pairing of, of all those measurements. Then you may need a finer – like a different magnifying glass, so a, little, a finer resolution, make, meaning measure your, your body weight every day and then get like a weekly average or look at them all, all the time. So weekly average might tell you. Um, or like I've had people with the skin folds who just, they, aren't very, they, don't, they don't retain the skill very well. So they may need to do it like every day. Yeah. It's like, okay, so what's going on? Or sometimes the skin fold, the calipers can get bad and they can sometimes bend, get a little bit bendy in the plastic. So it's like, well, hold on. The skin folds, like, it's changing in a way that doesn't make any sense. You lost eight pounds and the skin folds went up. What's going on here? Like, something's, something's awry. So those, those numbers are all self-reinforcing, and they should all sort of follow in, in line. So if one is sort of off, it could tell you that maybe you need to do something a little different. But they all should paint the same kind of picture for you. And it, when, you, when you see that and when a client sees that or you see that yourself, it can be so reassuring in the ways we've already kind of talked yeah. about, but when they all come together and they say the same thing, ah, that's nice. And, and the stress is so relieved. So imagine someone now who's listening to this, who maybe wasn't really doing any of those things. They weren't log booking. They're just like kind of looking in the mirror now and again. They don't know where they're trying to go. Like they haven't done any, like anything like a Dex or a skin fold. They haven't been doing any per- PRs in the gym. None of that kind of stuff. If you throw that all on top, and think about how much more confidence all those things could give you all at once compared to like doing maybe none of them or just occasionally some of them. You've taken care of a lot of what a coach could do. I'm not trying to put coaches out of business, but um, now, for instance, you can take that and remove that aspect of the coaching where they're providing confidence for you in a way that you really didn't know how to do previously. And now you can squeeze more out of your coach and make them into a better coach. So you don't have a, a coach who's hand holding and those sorts of things. And they can actually be a better coach for you because the quality of the information, it's like, okay, so we know what's going on here with all these progress measurements. So now let's take a look at your diet and see what food settle best with you. It's like, Oh my gosh, you don't have any, you've got no pre or probiotics going on in here. Like this is what needs to happen because we're so your weight was all over the place. We weren't even looking at your gut health. Now we've, we've got that whole thing taken care of. Now we can pay closer attention to your gut health, your exercise selection, and my muscle connection. All that stuff is good to go. And it opens up you for even further refinement in the other areas of bodybuilding. So there's a whole bunch of boxes in that sort of region that you can take care of by just having a good handle on whether you're progressing in the way you, in the direction you want to go. So yeah, I think. It's so well said on the body weight. So many people, and unfortunately, I would say 
females often, but I've had many men get really emotionally attached to scale. But when you use the other methods and I kind of, yeah, call it like triangulation when all of them are like pointing in the similar direction uh, and Mm -hmm. giving you kind of, and then you can be way more confident and you can look at the scale weight and you can be like, oh yeah, I know that whatever it is, the menstrual cycle or um, I ate later that day or whatever it is. And you can kind of rely on the other methods and not get too obsessed about one. So yeah, I think like you said, if someone's not using any of these or they're just using one of them, then now they're kind of in a much better place to know if they're actually moving where they want to be going. Yeah. Yeah. It's self-diagnostics. Yeah, that's exactly it. Yeah. Scott, thank you so much for coming on. I don't know if you've got anything, have you got anything in the works? I know obviously you've got your two eBooks there that we'll have linked and available. Uh, Is there anything else on your end that's going on? You know, I guess I can sort of say this. We'll see. I don't know what the lag time will be, but um, I'll just throw this out. So in the scientific literature, there is very little that's sort of bodybuilding specific, but um, I don't know if I can, I'll just say that there are some people who you know, um, some pretty well, who have invited me, very graciously invited me to be involved with a research publication that's going to address Peak Week. Oh, awesome. Yeah. And it could be a while. I'm not sure how long it'll the, the publication lag will be, but we're putting together um, what is going to be, I think, sort of a ground laying type of review of the topic from A to Z, which I'm hoping will then launch um, the possibilities for some future research into, you know, all sorts of things like to what extent does carbohydrate loading actually increase muscle size and, right. you know, so, sodium and, and water manipulation, what does that truly do? What's going on hormonally, mechanistically? The, the multi, like what hap- How much can you increase muscle size with, the muscle, with getting pumped up? All yeah. those sorts of things. There's so many things that that you can sort of, there's physiological mechanisms we sort of tied to why those things work and how to do them, but they haven't been quantified. They haven't been scientifically investigated directly. So we're putting together this, this sort of massive um, sort of review of literature covering all, covering all the pieces that hopefully will be out soon. And I, uh, we, we're, we're writing it right now, I think, so it's, it's, it's definitely scientifically legit, um, but it's also pointing to the holes in the scientific literature and right. also will provide information for the layperson to go on Google Scholar, <laughs> dig it up, and I think it should be eventually be a free download. Amazing! Uh, if not right off the bat, I think it will be, depending on where we publish it. And it'll have things in there for coaches to look into. So, I mean, just like one aspect of it is just to keep people from hurting themselves yeah. during peak week. You know, with diuretics. Not so much in the natural community, but diuretics are probably the most dangerous aspect of bodybuilding in terms of like cause, at least immediate acute cause of death um, that I know of because it could, you can take people out pretty rapidly and it doesn't need yeah. to happen. So that's, that's been a kind of a, a project that's been in the back, background that I think is going to be very, very, very cool. Once it kind of finally comes out, so you, um, I'm excited for that. You, you probably could, yeah. You probably load up several interviews based on yeah. just that paper because you you'll know the people who are putting it out. I hate to be for, so secretive, but I know <laughs> I don't know if I have clearance to talk about it, but I it's it's coming out for sure. There's some way this information is getting out because we put a lot of time in on it. So amazing, it should be very yeah. cool. There's so little on peak week out there, and a lot of it's based on like cyclists and like glycogen supercompensation. And I think mm-hmm. the last one I only really saw was like the shadows of the bodybuilders in terms of like glycogen replenishment, trying to be bigger, and that right. kind of showed improvement. So yeah, this is and it's really cool to hear that you're involved as well. I think it's going to be yeah, a lot of people who are going to be interested in that. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be badass. It's going to be very, very, very cool to read and just see the reactions and. I think it's going to be nice to see how helpful it is for people. Yeah. You know, and to give just sort of some guidelines as to just real the basics, literally a little kind of a, a little bit of a map through what is probably the toughest part for many people. Uh, I mean, talk about having confidence and not like, you know, shooting yourself in the foot during the last week. Like how yeah. many people have just tried to do crazy shit natural or not with diuretics or not. And they just, they freak out and what have you. And like, a whole prep is lost because of some silly maneuver in the last minute that Absolutely. was unnecessary. So this, this will help hopefully help people reap the benefits of all the hard work, so to speak, they put in when it comes to stepping on stage and finally presenting the physique that they've, they've tried to produce. For awesome. Yeah. I have yeah. to, 
I'll have to get some interviews lined up for that and uh, I'll make sure people kind of can find your Instagram and obviously your kind of website and everything. I'll make sure that's linked below as well. I don't know if you want to just give it a quick plug or your Instagram at least. Yeah, sure. Fortitude underscore training. You can just, you can just type in fortitude training or Dr. Scott Stevenson bodybuilding. And you'll find my Facebook and my Instagram and everything, but fortitude underscore training is, is me. Awesome. So you'll see me grimacing <laughs> most of the time and, and podcasting. Thank you so much, Scott, for coming on. And uh, thank you, everyone, for listening. We'll catch you soon. Yes, indeed. So I'm Steve Hall, founder of Revive Stronger and a coach of Revive Stronger. My name is Pascal Floor. I'm the co-owner of Revive Stronger and also a coach, of course. You Revive Stronger has probably been going solidly for three years, probably roughly about three years. Revive Stronger to me, it is becoming kind of my child, my foster child. It's the gathering and getting together of like-minded people. We've been expanding the coaching team, which is helping us help more people, uh, but each coach can only help a certain number of people. Right now, it's all over the place. We have YouTube, we have Facebook, we have Instagram, but there isn't that community aspect behind that. And so the next step for us is developing a membership site. So basically we want to create a family and a community that is then benefiting from another, a really cool community for people within our little niche. It's gonna be a website. They will get early access to our podcast. You can access us, ask us questions, the community aspect. We have a forum there, you can ask questions, but also you can, you can lock your journey. It's also gonna be courses on there, courses, presentations on different topics. Discount of past seminar footage. We will log our journey as well. We'll start vlogging. We're gonna have documentaries, our entire athletic journey. Furthermore, they get access to an exercise video library. The exercises that we love for hypertrophy and maximizing hypertrophy, we're gonna go through those in depth, telling you how to execute them. We kept them concise and also mobile friendly so that you can watch them in between your sets. I'm super excited to grow this community. The amount of value that we're gonna be delivering is huge. And I'd love you to be part of it. You will get so much out of that. I'll see you inside.